Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Spanning the Knee. Tonight, we're going to talk about life, food, and politics. To do that, a good friend of mine, former Ohio State Senator, Minority Leader, Executive Residence at American University School of Public Affairs, and the cookbook author who just released her cookbook, United We Eat, the Honorable Capri Cafaro. Capri, hey. thank you for joining me tonight. It's always a pleasure Anytime. to see your face. I'm always happy to join, sure. And and when we talk about, and we'll get into the cookbook thing, it just makes me hungry. <laughs> well, it, it, it's the dinner time. So if you haven't eaten already, you're going to have to after the show. Exactly. And 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 now that, and, and that's a lot to say, and you've done a lot just from where you were and you're originally from uh, Ohio. And, and I'm Youngstown. sitting here right now, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in your, okay. That's even better. And, and the nice thing about it is um, your hometown, Youngstown, Ohio, You've been on a variety of shows. You've done a lot in the community. Tell us kind of how you got started with everything to where you are now. Sure. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I've actually never thought about this until right this second. So my, I always say that my, my path into public service um, was very much influenced by my grandfather uh, on my mother's side, who was a World War II veteran and, and uh, you know, a small business guy and, and built highways here and was actually the site contractor for General Motors or Lordstown, but he always was a hero to me in many ways, you know, as someone who, I remember when I wrote a, um, a report on World War II and I, I, was, I was at my grandparents' house and they, I, I said, oh, I'm writing something on the Battle of the Bulge. I went and got an encyclopedia off the shelf. And for anyone that forgot about those, they did exist once upon a time. <laughs> and, and so he told me, put it away. I, I was in the Battle of the Bulge. Anyway, why do I go and like rewind all of this? My grandfather got Alzheimer's. Um, it's what, um, you know, influenced me to focus my career specifically in health policy, commit myself to public service. And obviously coming from the Mahoning Valley and having this view, I mean, I was born not, not very long after um, the collapse of the steel mills, Black Monday, all of that. And, and so I always heard about what was and always felt that, you know, what is the best way that we can, we can um, improve the lives of others. And I always felt the government was that way. So my grandfather in many ways influenced my path into public service, my choice in, in, you know, concentrating my efforts in health policy. And then my grandmother, also my mother's mother. So this is all my, my mother's parents, the Silvestri's. Um, and so she is how I learned how to cook. So, you know, and so I would be making stuff, whether it was pizzelles or, you know, whatever, lasagna, um, bonbon cookies with my grandmother, but also, I mean, she, you know, all, also made all of the American classics. So I guess ultimately I owe this entire circuitous affair to my grandparents, George and Elvira Silvestri. <laughs> And you talk about Pacelles. I'm Italian, 100% Italian. Me and my my wife love Pacelles. Oh, I have a burn on my arm actually from my Pacelle iron <laughs> from Christmas like two years ago. Um, this is yeah. what happens when you're trying to. I, I now have an electric iron. My grandmother, you know, she had the one that you actually had to hold and flip. Um, the old school one. The old school one, like, which is really brutal and very hard. But, you know, she, I mean, it takes a long time to make a lot of pit cells with that one uh, singular iron over that you have to flip over the uh, the stove. But, um, yeah, I mean, no question that my Italian-American heritage has absolutely influenced my work ethic, uh, my commitment to community, and certainly my love of food and bringing people together through it. And, and that's funny because, um, so my grandma used to make pastels like no other. My mother-in-law makes really good pastels and she's probably going to like me for, for, for saying that. On, there, on, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they're just pastels. Like I could sit there and just eat them and not eat dinner, lunch or breakfast in a day. Now I got a question. I got are, are you, do you do anisette or do you do vanilla and lemon? Like what do you guys do? Are I don't know. She just puts it in front of me. Uh, fair enough. Well, yeah. They, we do pretty explicitly anisette, so uh, that licorice, that licorice uh, taste. Yeah, and, and that actually brings it, we talk about that, but you're originally from Youngstown, Ohio, where that is a huge heritage of Italians. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, this brings up something also kind of interesting. So one of the other food-related things I'm doing, I have a new podcast slash radio show on something called the Heritage Radio Network, which has been around for about a decade. And they focus explicitly on 
um, food related audio content. And, uh, and so I have a new show there called Eat Your Heartland Out, um, which is about the, you know, the, the intersection of food and culture in the American Midwest. I bring this up because I think this week's episode, I recorded a, like most of them already. So I don't know which ones they put out, but I think this week's episode is the one about um, Southern, Southern European immigrants. And, and this, this episode specifically is Italians and Greeks. So there's a, there's a, a little bit of discussion about the cookie table, a lot of discussion about obviously, um, you know, the role of the industrial Midwest and Youngstown and, and um, you know, the, the presence of Italian Americans in, in our community here in the Mahoning Valley. I am not from Youngstown, just I'm, I'm from, I'm from Liberty slash Trumbull County, five generations of Trumbull County, but you know, Youngstown and Warren is all the same thing, I guess. And I never actually represented Mahoning. I was Trumbull, no. Aguila, and Giaga. Yeah, you you were you were a, a senator for the state of Ohio. Uh, in the so tell us a little bit about how you kind of got into politics after you became uh, graduated. You came back and and, and just kind of started that way. Sure, um, you know, I mean, basically, I had always, as I said, I mean, I, I had always had this, you know, I guess um, goal or. Um, aspiration to come back and serve my community as a public servant. You know, I'd spent time, um, I, I have a, actually have a master's degree um, dealing with um, international, focused in international affairs. Um, and, but, you know, I ended up not using that obviously, but I, I had always thought that I wanted to come home and serve my community. Um, as some of you may know, you know, I, I started my, my, where I have my policy knowledge, particularly when I started out was in federal policy. So, you know, I rolled the dice essentially um, and ran for Congress when I was barely constitutionally eligible to do so. <laughs> Figured like how, what, what you know, could go wrong. Um, the worst that could happen is I lose the primary. I actually won the primary, um, lost the general, expected to lose the general, but um, it that sort of set the stage and certainly provided me with a, a lot of very, unique insights and experiences from, from a campaigning perspective and, and a nuts and bolts perspective to bring to sort of the next round, which, which ultimately just two years later was the state Senate. So my successor in 2006 was elected attorney general that opened a vacancy the way that the Ohio constitution works. Vacancies are filled by uh, appointment. So I was appointed to fill the unexpired term, which was two years then stood for election in 2008 and 2012. And then Ohio has ter constitutionally mandated term limits. So I've been out of office since 2016, which is why I'm now on faculty at American University and their School of Public Affairs in DC, where I continue to focus my efforts on health policy. I have a, no a number of visiting fellowships um, at international institutions, again, related to my work in health policy. And then I'm still very involved uh, locally here at home in Trumbull County um, with, with you know, seniors and, and with um, victims of domestic violence, um, as well as higher ed being on the board of, of uh, Youngstown State University. So still very engaged in the community, um, but uh, no longer involved in politics, so to speak, which is totally fine by me. <laughs> yeah, and, and you bring two, you bring Youngstown State, which is a huge institution in the Mahoning Valley, and it really does a lot for our community, and, and Coach Tressel and President Tressel now um, are doing an exceptional job trying to, during this pandemic. And, and you talk about um, doing a lot of stuff in the community. You've done Variety sat on boards. You've also done a lot of philanthropy. You've done a lot of charity events. And actually, um, we, we talked a little bit earlier before we got on about um, about you per, you played at the Eastwood Field at the time, um, a charity softball game. Um, and uh, we, uh, we thought we would be to show you the picture <laughs> of her playing in the softball game. Oh my God. It's a little hard here. I'll, I'll, there we go. Okay, we'll just... You don't have to make it any bigger. It's all good. I can see it. That's hilarious. That was actually a blast. You know, I mean, you, and I have to say again, Tony, you always were, um, you know, you have always put the community, the Mahoning Valley uh, first in your work. Um, and the, the uh, softball game for hope was, is no different. And so I was, I was honored to have an opportunity to participate in that. I think that was back in, 
Oh, seven or oh eight. It was early in my tenure, if I was, if I'm not mistaken. So, but yeah, good, I, good I, times, I, and um, you know, it's it's. You guys won because that was it was Trumbull versus Mahoning. That's right. Yes, it was Trumbull versus Mahoning, and you, and then we had um, you. I forget who your coach was. I think it was uh, Jim Graham at oh, the time. Jim Graham. <laughs> um, and Beatrice was on the other end and tried to buy runs. I don't know if you're. Uh, uh, but that was, it was a good it's time a to play on it. People, it's a charity game. <laughs> yeah, it's a charity. Exactly. And, and the nice part about it is it's all for a good cause. Number one, number two, it gets very competitive. Right. And you're playing at a first class facility, uh, single A baseball in that's a Cleveland Indians facility with, we hope they'd ever leave because it's a, such I a agree. I agree. We love the scrappers. We love scrappy. And if I ever get a dog, I'm naming it scrappy. So, <laughs> Hey, there is nothing wrong with that. So now you're teaching, you'd love what you do. You're, you're on, you're one of a uh, special guests on Fox a lot of times during that. Yeah. And, um, and then now we come to this pandemic. So what have you been doing during this pandemic? <laughs> well, um, you know, for the first two months, I was actually locked down in DC teaching um, remotely, um, you know, we, they essentially, um, cause American university is in DC. So I was teaching child and family policy um, and uh, we were scheduled to come back from spring break and they basically extended that and, and put us all through a bunch of training to, um, you know, get geared up to teach online. They did the, the, I will say the administration did an excellent job. So I was teaching online. I was doing some, um, you know, remote um, television uh, at the time. You know, Fox was, uh, you know, mostly sort of shifted their focus to guests that were medically related. So I wasn't doing as much Fox, but was still doing some television, um, you know, sort of finishing up the process of gearing up for this cookbook. I recorded pretty much all of the, uh, episodes for this new uh, radio show online in in the um, you know and so basically just and then every whatever anybody else is doing I mean who knows you know it's um, I well I mean I guess I I did do I will I did I tried very hard and it's not something that like I like advertise I guess but I I did do what I could as far as try early on trying to get PPE to folks in the valley. Um, so I worked with, I commissioned somebody out in Tremont up in Cleveland to help make masks and gowns that we tried to get out to um, the a couple of the hospitals up in Ashtabula County, as well as Saney's oncology unit. And then I, I started doing online counseling um, sessions, volunteer kind of like sessions for um, Someplace Safe, which is our domestic violence shelter. I'm on their advisory council. I'm also a licensed social worker. So I'm continuing to do that to this day. Um, so uh, at, usually once a week, I try to, you know, do some uh, sort of um, virtual one-on-ones volunteering with individuals that are in shelter right now uh, at Someplace Safe, trying to utilize my um, my social work skills. So, um, you know, trying to do my best uh, from afar uh, in the pandemic. Well, I think I think when once kind of April and May came around, it was like all hands on deck. Yep. Uh, and I mean, I know uh, working at the time at the university, same thing, all hands on deck and all the hospitals were the same. Yep. And, and, and it's funny that now we think that we can beat this and now everything, all the cases are going up and the governor just of Ohio just made an announcement with Minnesota and everything like that. Wear a mask now. It's going to be mandated starting ne- tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. And uh, I've been wearing a mask. Me and my wife and I have been wearing masks. We we feel that that's the best option, no matter if you tell us to or not. It- Absolutely. Well, my, you know, my my sister is immunocompromised. Um, so while you know she and I live in totally different places, um, you know, I'm very cognizant of that. Um, she's actually now staying with me over the summer because she lives in New York. So she literally did not leave her apartment for 14 weeks. Oh, and um, because as she she described it, she was worried about the pig pen cloud that was coronavirus anywhere that you would go in Manhattan. So, um, you know, and even though she's young, I mean, she's 36, that's still a frightening concept. So, you know, we had always been wearing masks and gloves and so we're very vigilant. So now she's hanging out here and, uh, you know, at my house over the, you know, throughout the summer, which 
you know, is a lot more room and a lot more, a lot more places to roam than New York. You can easily get curbside anything. And so it's a much safer alternative. And hopefully now with the mask mandate, you know, we'll see um, our cases get in check here in Ohio. New York seems to be, you know, uh, trending appropriately, but with with the, certainly in in the city of New York, when you have so many people in such confined uh, confined environment, it's incredibly difficult to you know socially distance. Uh, you know, so I don't know how they're going to continue to um, maneuver through that. And as we approach the school year, all across the country, you know, that's kind of the next frontier. Here is now what. Well, and I think that's a big question. And I think the problem, and this is just me personally, is the problem with ed educational K to 12 is there's no set across the board. Everyone's doing their own thing and there's no one providing information to them enough. If you go to one school, it's the totally opposite of what yeah. the next school district is. And I think that's a problem. It's a challenge. I mean, look, and I say this as a, as a former state legislator, but I think a lot of people feel like this, that you know, school level, school district level decisions are often best decided at that school district level. However, Correct. dealing with a communicable disease, and that's the difference. So we're not just dealing with, you know, and, and it, with whatever kind of situation that you want to deal with with your school district, you know, getting the parents and teachers involved and the superintendent, the school board, and making those local decisions is very important. Um, you know, and I think that we wouldn't necessarily see we do have statewide mandates in education now, certainly. Um, but, you know, we are used to having local control and individual freedoms. And I think that is where this challenge has come in this pandemic where, you know, at our core, we're, we are both of those things. We, you know, feel like we're all autonomous. We have, um, you know, the freedom to do what we want, to make our own decisions. But when our own decisions and our own conduct impact others, that's when things shift and they change. And so, uh, you know, I do hope that people heed the call and can, and are responsible uh, and realize the gravity of, of the situation of, of the pandemic. Look, nobody wants to wear a mask and likes it. Who cares? You know, I mean, it's about it's about consideration for others. Um, almost before yourself oftentimes, particularly for those of us that are younger and people say, oh, you're not in a risk group. Well, people are dying in their 30s and 40s too, mm -hmm. yeah, even children. So, you know, you gotta be, you gotta care about others. It's about protecting the community. Yeah, it's, and it's protecting yourself as well. Like you said, you have a sister that has a, a kind of a, an immune system that you wanna keep safe. Yep. And that that's and that's a big thing. Right is. Yeah, and, and you want, and, it is nice that she can get out of a small apartment and back to back home, back with you, and and kind of move around a little bit, just a little bit yeah. bigger. Yeah. And yeah, and but it but it gives some sense of relaxation because you're probably not in that confined area where you got 10 million people within right. within well, 50 you miles. Go, you can go out in the yard any day, any time. You know, whereas you're like stuck in New, you know New York, you're stuck. And so you know, I think sometimes too. When it, those of us that are, you know, in the suburbs or the country, however you want to say it, in places like Ohio, maybe we take that a little bit for granted that, well, you know, it's our, it's just our family. It's our nuclear thing. We got, you know, our yard, we have our house, we have our car. We don't have to rely on public transportation. You know, if somebody gets sick, maybe they can go in a spare bedroom and you can leave stuff out outside the door for them. You know, people in other, in, in bigger cities don't have that luxury. Um, but it doesn't really matter because, again, everybody is at risk, whether you are in a big city or a small town, urban or rural, we're all at risk. And uh, I think that the that the American public is, is getting wind of that. And, and I'm very glad to see again, at least personally, I know that not everyone agrees, but personally, I'm very glad to see Governor DeWine finally, um, after his stern talking to last week, <laughs> um, I think he was like, look, Ohio. Like a parent's you're talking to their kid. Exactly. You're going to be grounded. And they didn't listen. So now Ohio's grounded with the mask. And, and it's funny, the comments I got from online that said, I said, please interpret what the governor just said. Well, just father, father, son, daughter, speak about what you did, what you're doing wrong and what you should be doing. Yep. Or, or if you don't do this, I'm going to punish you. And, and I think it politically, he tried everything he could to get people to do it without making it mandated. Yep, he did. I think he did. And, and you know, I think it's a, um, you know, it's, it's a 
fine line, particularly in Ohio, I think, you know, and there are certainly very vocal members of the General Assembly that have been anti-mask. There's been protests, you know, uh, the, that sort of thing. But Governor DeWine was praised early on nationally uh, for his rapid and decisive um, approach to trying to deal with this virus. And again, a lot of people thought to themselves, well, Ohio, you know, nobody comes here. We don't know any, but there's no, people aren't coming from China. What are you talking about? It's not going to affect us. It's just going to be in the coast. It's, oh, it's over here in Seattle or over it's here in New York. And so I think that it was very, you know, prescient um, and I think, you know, really proactive on behalf of Governor DeWine to recognize that just because Ohio is not on a coast, um, doesn't mean that we're less vulnerable. And, um, you know, he really stemmed the tide there. And hopefully, again, fingers crossed that um, our um, our cases will con will now trend in the right direction again. And and we actually, at the beginning, you were praising Governor DeWine at the beginning because a lot of people were. And you also had Dr. Amy Atkin, who actually is a, Liberty, <laughs> is a Liberty grad. That's right, 1984. Yeah, Liberty grad. And people threaten her life. Are you kidding me? I know. And and she done she brought that the mom or that thing that like comfort yeah and I think a lot of people did and and what data you get is what you get I mean it changes every day with with the with the disease and the, and the right pandemic. I mean, and, and particularly in the early days of this nobody knew what the hell was going on let's be it's, honest yeah. so you know trying to figure out and learn on the job is where, you know, how is this thing spread? Oh, it's only spread by, you know, is it just spread by touch? Now you, people are asymptomatic, like, you, you know, and they can spread it. When that changed, when we figured out that you could not have symptoms and spread the virus, that's what changed the whole thing. I mean, we originally were told, oh, you have to have a fever, you have to have this, you have to have that. The different types of symptoms meandered, the way that it was transmitted had, you know, we were learning more about, um, so, you know, we as a society globally, as well as the individual policy and epidemiology leaders, were all sort of learning on the job. Um, even those with the greatest expertise were trying to like, you know, crack the Rubik's Cube in real time, which is, you know, a race against time, given the, you know, how fast um, COVID-19 is spreading. Well, and, and I think that brings a, a great point is now in the early stages, we have a shutdown. We had now we're opening up in phases, but now cases are starting to skyrocket. So we're in this pandemic where, hey, no one wants to go out anymore. So what is the biggest thing that brings everything together? Food. That's right. And 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 I think you you did something that was really unique. And you you started a, a cookbook. It's United We We Eat. And basically, it's basically you explain a little bit about your book. Sure. Uh, so uh, this was actually an idea that was born of my experience in the state Senate when I would work across the aisle with folks. And um, when we would have a legislative victory, I would bring in a pie and bring our um, you know, offices together in a way to build camaraderie. And so I thought to myself, you know, what better way to do two things, show that uh, food is a uniter to bridge the gap um, and and bring people together regardless of political affi affiliation and ideology, but it also can tell a story without words. And so the objective is twofold in this book. One, uh, as I said, to show that um, food is a unifier politically, regardless of, of whether you're left or right. And the other is to tell our nation's story through those dishes. So we have, uh, there are 50, recipes in the book. Um, and, well, there are 50, all 50 states are represented, including the, and the District of Columbia. And there's actually totally randomly two recipes from Maryland. And this is actually kind of a funny story. So there's actually 52 recipes, even though it says 50 recipes, because <laughs> um, it just sounds better. But there's 52 um, because it's, it's 50 plus DC. And then we had two from Maryland because Michael Steele, who's the former uh, Republican National Committee chair, was actually born and raised in DC. And when he agreed to submit a recipe for the book, um, I thought he was gonna submit for DC. He submitted for Maryland because he was also the former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. I had already gotten a recipe for, um, for crab cakes from the uh, chairman of the Maryland Democratic Party, Kathleen Matthews, who's actually former MSNBC host, Chris Matthews' wife, 
I was her intern like 25 years ago <laughs> in, in DC when she was an anchor on the ABC affiliate in Washington. And she's also a Stanford alumni along with myself. So I like, she was one of the first, she was the first person to give me a recipe. So um, I went out and I solicited recipes from Democrats and Republicans. Um, there's about 24 recipes from current and former political leaders in this book. Ohio was represented by our own Tim Ryan. Um, what did he make? He actually, this is another funny story. He gave me a zucchini and eggs recipe. Now that might sound super random, but this is this is kind of funny too, because he submitted his grandmother's pasta fizzle recipe. But the problem was is that Patrick Kennedy from Rhode Island also had already submitted pasta fizzle oh. because of Rhode Island. And it, you know, his, well, obviously Patrick is, is Irish, the, the state of Rhode Island has a, a big Italian American population. And so most of the current and former elected officials and political leaders that submitted, they either submitted some kind of a family recipe that oftentimes was still related to the state or something that was evocative of that state's culture. So Patrick gave me this, you know, possible recipe. So I went back to Tim and I was like, please, dude, can you help me out? Because I started to divide, once I was getting the recipes, I was dividing them up into categories. And I was, and then I started to fill in. Um, I adapted the remaining 26 recipes um, by doing research on the individual states, their agricultural output, um, their sort of state foods, uh, any iconic dishes that came from there, any famous you know, food brands or icons and, and try to bring those flavors together in something that was, you know, a, a unique reflection of those states, not just, oh, it's a Philly cheesesteak or, oh, it's Chicago deep dish pizza. You know, I tried to do something that was a little bit more off the beaten path um, in, in my research. And again, trying to tell, you know, some history and some context um, of uh, the, the, the culinary evolution um, and culture of these individual states. So I think to circle back to Tim, one of the reasons why I think Tim gave me this eggs recipe is because I said, I'm, I'm, I think I need a hole to be filled with breakfast. So thanks, Tim. <laughs> I really appreciate the hometown coming in the clutch for me. Come on, Tim. You know, now we want to see Tim cook it. Hey, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it can be arranged. <laughs> Well, Usually you know, when I do cooking segments, I got to do it with a Republican. So two Democrats does not make a bipartisan cooking segment. But hey, well, just bring bring your Republican friend and bring a Democratic friend. That's the only way to get them in the same room. Like That's you said, true. That's true. And and this is my you know when I uh, when I talked about this cookbook on Fox, it was interesting because I mentioned some of the Fox contributors that were in the book, including Donna Brazil, a Democrat, Mike Huckabee, a Republican. And I mentioned them simply because they are Fox News contributors. And a lot of people were, you know, oh my God, not Donna Brazil. And I said, whoa, 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 like on Twitter. And I said, look guys, you're missing the point. The whole point is you may not like Donna Brazil, but you may like her gumbo. And that's a start. It's yeah, a start, it you know, to, to let your guard down to humanize these elected officials and political figures that, you know, you may not like, but, you know, it's Donna Brazil's mom's gumbo recipe. She represented Louisiana. That's something that everybody can relate to. They have a family heirloom recipe. And so, you know, once I started talking about it a little bit more, people were like, oh, I get it. And so, you know, that it's just, that's one simple example of, of um, you know, what we hope to do with a very simple concept at a time where we're so divided, the news cycle is so negative that this is one uplifting way for us to bring people together and have a little bit of, you know, um, I guess joy, happiness, frivolity in, in these tough times. And I, and I think that brings up a great point that the, the name of your cookbook is United We Eat. It's more than a cookbook, am I right? That's right. That's right. Um, you know, so I mean, I I wrote an introduction that talks a lot about the role of food in politics and campaigning. Um, many of the um, many of the recipes that are submitted from the political figures uh, actually are uh, accompanied by anecdotes on how these individuals have used food previously to bring people together and set the table for compromise. Um, you know, some provide anecdotes about, you know, someone from across the aisle from history that they may want to have, you know, had dinner with if they would have an opportunity to go back in time. So again, it's, it's really, um, 
you know, trying to tell a, a larger story through individual experiences that are shared, uh, individual uh, recipes that are shared, and then bringing that all together, as I said, to show that food is a common denominator, but also the storyteller of what it means to be an American. We are very much, you know, multicultural, multi-ethnic nation. And the, our foods reflect that. They reflect everything from our indigenous roots uh, as, you know, uh, as a land, um, all the way to, you know, our very diverse immigrant uh culture and communities that have come and, and settled here are all across the nation. Well, and, and what are some, give us an idea. You gave us a couple uh, examples of what the recipes were. Give us some other examples of what people can expect recipe wise uh, and explain kind of how that approach came about. Sure. So there are a couple categories, as I said, like any cookbook. So we have breakfast, uh, starters, mains, sides, and desserts. Um, and so that'd be um, my areas, desserts, desserts, mine, mine too. Um, there's actually some really interesting stuff in desserts. Um, I'm a baker, you know, I, I mentioned pies before. Um, so I was really excited that former mayor Pete Buttigieg representing Indiana submitted his, um, uh, Hoosier pie, the sugar pie, ah. which is very, um, well known as an, as an Indiana staple. Um, we have, uh, Amy Klobuchar who, um, submitted a tater tot hot dish, which is apparently, I did not know this until she tweeted unsolicited and I almost like lost it. <laughs> it was like, go find this cookbook tomorrow. We'll see my award winning tater tot dish. I'm like, it's award winning. Why are you talking <laughs> about me, Amy Klobuchar? Oh my God. So, so she, and the book there. was coming out the next day. Huh? Yeah. And it, came up the next, it came out the next day. So she did <laughs> it on a Friday because it came out on the 4th of July. Um, so I was like, whoa. Um, I, you know, I'll give you one example of one that, uh, that I adapted for North Carolina. And I always talk about this recipe because it's just so pretty when you look at it in the book. It's it's jello salad, or excuse me, um, yeah, jello salad. So it's um, basically, it's a it's a red jello ring mold. Um, but it's, and it's Pepsi, it's a Pepsi salad. And the reason why Pepsi salad is North Carolina. So it's, it's red jello made with Pepsi and has black walnuts in it. And I chose this because Pepsi was founded in the late 1800s in North Carolina. Black walnuts are a big, um, producer, uh, in, um, a product in North Carolina. So, and Elvis apparently made Pepsi salad very popular, although he's not from North Carolina, but- No, he is definitely not. <laughs> but, but um, you know, so as I'm just doing this research on different types of things, just trying to, again, I didn't want to do another barbecue, you know, that sort of thing, trying to put these different types of things together. Another pie that I did was um, an apple pie with cheddar topping uh, and saltine crust for New Hampshire. Ooh. And um, and I did that that way because um, both apples and dairy are major agricultural products out of out of New Hampshire. Um, and saltine crackers, actually soda crackers are are a big thing in the in North in, in uh, New England. So when you think about the sweet and the tart and the salty with the apples, I, I brought I put that together. So those are just some examples. I mean, we have all kinds of things. I, California, actually, Ro Khanna from California submitted granola. I know that will make a lot of people laugh. The California's recipe is literally granola. Um, okay. So, yeah. Um, Mike Huckabee's was uh, um, barbecue. I mean, so, you know, there's there's a, a real variety of, of recipes. Um, I did one. I did a vegan recipe for um, Hawaii that was... Um, a, a tofu ramen uh, a recipe that usually was made with spam, but I decided to do it with tofu and alter it a little bit. Um, I also did one for Rainier cherries, uh, Rainier cherry glazed uh, ginger salmon fillets for Washington State, um, bringing together the famous salmon of the Pacific Northwest along with the Rainier cherry. So th again, those are some of the examples, trying to bring together those aspects, those stories, those flavors of each individual state to tell our country's story and to bring people together, obviously. Well, I can tell you from just hearing it, I'm, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go get that cookbook just because you hear some of these recipes that you've never heard of. Because I mean, I'm Ohio, okay? 
But when you go to these other states, you don't hear about those types of recipes and the background that you give with the recipe. That's right. Everything has a context and a story behind it. So, you know, you the the book is currently available on Amazon. It will be, um, you can go to our website as well, unitedweeat.com. You can find a link to the Amazon um, uh, site there to, to purchase it either hard copy um, or on Kindle, but we will be available um, uh, soon, probably by the end of the summer at independent booksellers, as well as a number of the other national chains. It is a process. I've learned a lot, um, you know, in some of the barriers as a first time author, um, you know, and, and my, my publishers explicitly really, you know, sort of cookbook and food. And so, you know, um, having to go through the process of you know, demonstrating sales and then sort of getting, you know, then you know, we're now getting the distributors to then deal with these other folks that are the independent booksellers and, you know, the other sort of chains and that sort of thing. So, you know, some of the major retail, uh, the other chain retail outlets, we're looking for them around October. Because the difference it. from running for an office. Um, yes and no, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, else, I mean it, it, there's still a lot of work that needs to be, you have to still, um, there's a lot of public relations, I guess, involved in this. And, and I still take it, uh, pretty seriously, you got to make sure that people are satisfied and you're meeting their expectations. And so I guess in that respect, that's any job. Um, yeah, pretty much. But it's, um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed it. It has been a labor of love. It has been a different experience, but a rewarding one for sure. Well, and, and I think that brings, brings it that food bring. Now, wouldn't that be nice if you could get all 51 or 52 recipes in this, the guys all or girls, ladies and gentlemen, in the same room to cook everything? That would be awesome. Maybe one of these days, post pandemic. I mean, we'll see because you know we had a lot of different plans, like doing things at both conventions, for example, that obviously are, you know had to be axed because of the pandemic. So, you know, there's there's I, I think a lot of future opportunities to build upon this concept um, once you know things um, you know sort of transcend the new normal and maybe get back to a circumstance where we can have more people in one place safely. Um, I certainly do hope that we can get more people in that room and more people. Hey, I can room. get, I, you tell me the names and, and I will invite them and we will get them on, on one show, one episode here. I will be happy to do all 50 to 52 awesome. well, people. Well, you know, get the book and you'll see them it, all. Exactly. <laughs> and get the book and, and, here, here it is again, everyone. It's United We uh, We Eat by Capri Cafaro. Um, it's uh, it's going to be out there. You can get it at Amazon or at unitedweeat.com. It's coming. It's there. It's 50 to 52 recipes, as she mentioned. To it Formale. is actually 50 recipes, but it says 50 recipes to bring us all together. It's 52 <laughs> to be exact, but, you know, 50 states plus the District of Columbia. I guess, you know, in our next version, if we, you know, we get come out with a you know, a second edition, we will, we will go for Puerto Rico, the U S Virgin islands, American Samoa and Guam. So that's, that's uh, the next round. And I can only imagine what those tremendous recipes will come in. I mean, the, I, the, just the flavoring that comes out of those areas. Right. So, and, and, and actually that brings, that kind of brings me to a point that we, you, you talk about all these people that have supplied a recipe Republican, Democrat, Independent, no matter who who they are, but we still have problems between Republicans and Democrats. Well, they obviously haven't gotten the cookbook yet. What can I say? <laughs> no, we have not gotten. I mean, the cookbook. We, we are in a difficult time. I mean, and I, I don't mean to try to like end things on a on a more sobering note, but I, I would say that you know, if we want to combat extreme partisanship we need to do two major things to reform government. One is redistricting reform um, to ensure that gerrymandering does not um, favor one party or the other so much that that uh, whoever the incumbents are, whoever the candidates are, are more concerned about a challenge within their own party um, that they see compromise as a dirty word because they, they see that as a potential um, you know, risk to their political career. And then I would also say, obviously, campaign finance reform. People spend too much time, particularly members of the House, um, you know, having to spend all of their time on the phone raising money and not enough time, um, you know, working, uh, you know, for um, for the people. And that's not their fault. It's it's the sad state of affairs on on how camp how expensive campaigns are 
and the environment in which you know allows that level of expensive campaign to thrive. So I think those two things are incredibly necessary. Um, and slowly but surely, at least on the redistricting front, um, with redistricting reform, we're seeing some of that, um, you know, all across the country, including in Ohio, um, which is not won't be implemented until 2022. But you know, and we don't know how that how successful that will be either. I'm opt cautiously optimistic, but who knows what that's going to look like? I've already started to hear that people are concerned already, um, and nothing has happened really yet. So, um, you know. We're at a, I think, a critical moment in our nation's history, um, and we can either use this year, 2020, as a, a turning point to make our nation better, to make it more compassionate, um, to to make us uh, more invested in our community and our neighbors, or we can go the other way and continue to be more divided, uh, to point fingers and and to create a, you know a culture of us versus them. I hope we pick the former and not the latter. Well, and I think that brings up a great point. We talk about what's going on with districting, campaign finance, and some other other stuff. And we just found out yesterday, or, or I'm sorry, today. It feels like it's been forever well, that okay. yeah, yeah, was okay. that there's a big bribery scandal in the mm -hmm. Ohio uh, House with the speaker. Yep. yep. And sixty million dollars. That's uh, you were in the Senate. Wow. Uh, I mean, they think it's a sixty million dollar bribe can uh, for the House Speaker. Uh, and I mean, you were you were in the Senate. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, and there's probably. I mean, what do you? What would be going on in someone's mind to do that? I, I mean, I was flabbergasted by the the amount, um, by the sheer. Um, uh, level of hubris exhibited by both company A, um, as it says in the indictment, but we all know is First Energy, um, you know, and uh, Larry Householder and and you know sort of his his band of 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 merry men um, <laughs> that, that they thought that they could do this and get away with it, and that power and control and money was so important to them that they were willing to risk everything. Um, it's just, uh, it's it turns my stomach, as my grandmother would say. I'm glad to see so many people, Democrat and Republican, calling for the resignation of Speaker Householder. Speaker Householder, is, as some know, and definitely people in Columbus know, I never served with Householder. He was there before me and he came after me. So he was the Speaker in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and then he came back in, 2016, in the 2016 election cycle. So I missed him entirely. But I, I knew him by reputation, and I think most everybody did. And it was not one of integrity. And so I think that on some level, no one is surprised that this is what it's come to with Larry Householder. But the fact that it was able to get this far, the fact that it was able to happen, the fact that somebody that already had a history was able to come back um, and, and execute this type of, of plan. Um, and uh, just, again, there are really no words for it. I mean, it, it, is a, it is a black mark on our state. It is, it is a black mark on the institution of the Ohio General Assembly. Um, and I feel sorry for so many of my colleagues that were not involved that have to now deal with this, you know, and I'm glad to see that my successor, my successor in the Senate, Sean O'Brien, introduced the repeal of House Bill 6, which was the core of this issue um, that First Energy Company A was advocating to get these uh, energy, uh, these clean energy credits for to basically bail out their two nuclear power plants. Um, Sean O'Brien didn't vote for House Bill 6 when it came to the Senate, whatever, last year, um, he has now introduced the bill. To repeal it. I said this to my sister last night when this was going on. I'm like, if I were in the Senate, damn it, I would have already been on the phone being like, we're going to repeal this right now. And so I'm so glad that my senator is the mm. one that did it. Um, and also my co my former colleague who was a senator and is now in the House, Michael Skindle, who's also the House sponsor of the repeal um, I'm glad to see that people are stepping up. There's no ambiguity um, on where people stand, and that's very important in this moment. Uh, you know, I'm I'm the second longest serving member of the Joint Legislative Ethics Committee in the history of the state of Ohio, only surpassed by the founder of the Joint Legislative Ethics Committee, former Speaker 
Bill Batchelder. And I say that because that it's one of my proudest accomplishments as, uh, as a member of, of the state Senate. But in that capacity, you know, you really get to know and you really value that integrity in public service. And so I really was feeling for my JLEC colleagues. I know some of them are, you know, still on JLEC. I'm like, we dealt with a lot of sort of nickel and dime stuff when I was there. I can't even imagine what that was like to get that call. Um, but, you know, that's, it's, I, I feel for um, the leaders right now down there that have to clean up this mess. Um, and and uh, I, but I have faith that um, folks like uh, Sean O'Brien, um, a Democrat, uh, Larry Obhoff, this president of the Senate, a Republican and a good friend of mine, originally from Astrobula. I have faith that these folks are going to be able to, to clean it up and turn it around. So, I mean, it's not like it's hundreds of thousands. It's sixty million dollars. Well, whether it's, whether it's six or sixty million, I mean, it's it's bad, it's wrong, and it's illegal. Mm -hmm. But my God, I mean, it's <laughs> I, I've never heard, and and. I think the other part of this that can't be lost on folks is this was a two and a half year period of time, sixty million dollars in two and a half two and a half years, um, and again the hubris I think of a multi multi you know billion dollar corporation to be behind this. I mean I again it's alleged it's company correct a, you know I I want to be careful with you know it's my all proven here. guilty. Uh, exactly. You know, you're innocent until proven guilty. But um, there's only one group that could have benefited from House Bill six, just one in the state of Ohio. Pretty much. Not multiple, not multiple. It was just one for one company. A. That's right. For company A. And company A is the only ones that have nuclear power plants. <laughs> yeah. I'm aware. Yeah. Well, I, I isn't there. Uh, I didn't build one. No, I, can't. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't got no. one in my backyard. No, but I, I think there's going to be, even the governor has asked for his resignation. Right. Um, I know uh, stories across the country. Fox picked it up, CNN, yep. and some others have picked you it up. They had it just like uh, shortly after it broke here locally. Yeah, and I think, uh, and I talked to several people, and, and they were, I think people are still stunned to the amount and what actually went on. Because I think the group where they talked about 15 or 20 um, representatives oh, or representatives, yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think there's going to be more, um, coming out down the road, but it's well, still a shock. Well, the U S attorney was very clear about the fact that this is an ongoing investigation. Mm -hmm. and while he could only speak to, as he referred to it, the four corners of the indictment. Uh, he was very clear that this is an ongoing investigation that, um, you know, if you know something come forward, and that they are not going to stop Democrat or Republican. They're going to allow, uh, you know, the facts to lead them. And, and I, you know, I have a great deal of, um, I think, faith and respect for what I saw um, at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Ohio. Um, and, and you know, their FBI colleagues obviously spent a lot of time um, and uh, put together these pieces Um that are very much in black and white. If you read the indictment, um, you know, phone, uh, basically recorded conversations, phone records, bank, bank rank, bank, they got it all. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, you know, it, it's not frivolous. And, um, and again, as I said, it, it breaks my heart because it really does. Um, I never like to see Ohio in a nationwide spotlight like this, but well, and actually, the Mahoning Valley has been in the spotlight quite a bit over the last 40 years with the steel mills, the mm -hmm. Lordstown plant. Uh, you just you big, big unemployment now in the area. Yep. Hopefully we'll come back one day. I mean, people are praying. We'll see what happens. I, look, I mean, I have again, I always have faith in our community. I mean, we are. We are fighters. We are. I mean, we are. Our, our mascot's name is Scrappy. Scrappers yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Um. You know, and and it's because we are resilient. Um. Because you know we can adapt. Because we. But at the same time, we never have given up on our community. And I think that's what makes us special. Is that you know anybody else might just say forget it. Um. But when you look at as well, so many success stories that come out of this valley too. Mm -hmm. um, what really makes our community unique. Um, so I'm very proud uh, to be five generations Trumbull County. 
Um, and I'm Trumbull County. I was born. Well, I have to take that back. I was born in. in well, we were all born at Saint E's. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I was born in PA, but Whoa. I I was born in PA. I think a lot, of, but pretty much moved to Warren, Ohio, or Howland Township right. when I was like three, and lived and pretty much haven't gone. Well, I live in the city of Youngstown now, but I lived at home for twenty some years. So. Home and grown Trumbull County, if you really look at it that way. But yep. my heart's okay. to the Mahoning Valley. That's right. The valley is the valley. You know, you gotta you gotta love you gotta love the penguins, you gotta love, you know, the scrappers, you gotta love, you know, everything that this is this community is about. And all 20,000 of our Italian festivals, you know, whether it's Mount Carmel, Youngstown Italian Fest, the other Mount Carmel and Niles, the Warren Fire Italian Hill. Fest, Fire Hill. We got them all. Yeah, I mean. And I think that's, we're very, like you said earlier, and I won't drag that on a little bit, but talk about eth ethnicity in our area, just Italians, Slovaks. I mean, you name it, it's right. in Youngstown, Ohio. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's our own little world showcase. Um, as, as I say, as a, a big fan of, of Disney and Epcot Center, you know, you can go around the world in our community, you know, and that, and I think that, you know, we're missing, um, we're missing that this summer, obviously, because you know I can set my clock any summer by our fairs and festivals, and that was also another, I think, motivator for me with the cookbook, because you know being in the community and going to these events all the time as a candidate and later as elected official, you see how these these uh, fairs and festivals bring people together. But they're always, you know, you have the heart for the, you know, the Hartford Apple Festival and the Lordstown Apple Festival and the Huntsburg Pumpkin Festival and all these, you know, and the Warren, you know, St. Demetrius Greek Festival and the Greek Festival in Louisville. I mean, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, we got umpteen ones up in, you know, ja in, uh, in uh, Ashville County as well, Wine and Walleye and Geneva Grape Chambery and, and, you know, the Grand Valley Festival in Orwell. So you have all these different things that are, that are celebrating both cultures like Italian, Greek, Slovak, whatever. Uh, and then food, whether it's, you know, pumpkin, grape, <laughs> you know, strawberries, apples, potatoes, whatever it may be. Um, and it just shows how those items, you know, bring a community together, even if it's just for a week or a weekend. Well, and I think that 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 really is is kind of you every festival. What do they have? Food. That's right. And you brought a uh, you turn the book turned out great from what I've read and what I've seen and I commend you for it. Thank you. And, and uh, you got I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. You up for a little Q and A? Sure. So here's our first question. The first question is from Chris. He says, "Were you able to make all of those recipes and taste them? Which one is the best?" Oh, that's a really, that's a really good question, and I was not able to make them all um, for a couple different reasons. One, as we were finalizing them, we started like it was in the beginning of March, so it limited some of the stuff. Um, so I would be going back and forth. We had with the cookbook publishers because they're cookbook like specific they have recipe testers that have to work through them all so i would go back and forth with them and so if we had to adjust recipes that at least i did like you know we would work together on that aspect um you know there were certain things that i couldn't necessarily make like cactus um and i don't have a smoker so i didn't do any of those um but um you know i would have to say that um gosh i mean as far as a favorite is concerned it's hard to say because I mean they're they're all so different. Um, I just recently um, did the um, muffins for Oregon, which are pear chai spiced um, muffins for Oregon, and those are actually quite good. So I'll I'll say I will give those as my favorite for today, but that doesn't mean I'm going to change my I won't change my mind tomorrow. So I've done most of them, but there are there are certainly some that I couldn't do because I was limited either from being able to access those ingredients at the time um, or because I didn't actually have the like actual thing. But most of those came from the other folks, if you will, that, you know, that submitted the recipes. I nice. did do Michael Steele's 10 layer cake and I actually did it on television. Oh, uh, that was, that was really interesting. That takes a very long time. The that's prep. also real. That's an incredible, I'll give you the, the Smith Island 10 layer cake from Maryland. Two thumbs up for that, but it takes like three hours. <laughs> we're gonna, you know, what we're gonna do down in September. We're gonna get you back on, and we're gonna be, we're gonna pick a couple different, okay, um, couple different ones, and we're gonna do live cooking. 
I can do it. I've, I've done live cooking already on Zoom. So and we'll be I, and we're, right. we're going to do it and we're going to take what we'll do is we'll take some um, some s examples or some suggestions from the audience or from Absolutely. the people and see what we can come up with and see what we can actually do, depending where we are pandemic wise. Right. Absolutely. So, OK, next question. Oh, this is this will be a good one. This one's from Nick. Will you ever run for office again? Never say never. I mean, but right now that is certainly not on my agenda. Um, you know, I, I certainly am not going to rule it out. I very much believe in public service. I very much dislike politics. <laughs> I've, I've, I've always kind of been like that. You know, I'm a policy person at heart. Um, you know, I'm glad that I have an opportunity to stay involved in my community through YSU and the Gerard Multigen Center and the Ohio Association of Free Clinics and Someplace Safe and, you know, the Attitude House. I mean, I'm very involved um, and, you know, I'm trying to keep my policy chops sharp as well through my academic work. But um, it's certainly not top of mind, but um, I am certainly not running, ruling it out tomorrow or, or the next year's unlikely, but, um, you know, you never know what the future will hold. Or and an I, hour if a politician. I literally hate to give that answer because it sounds like I'm being a coy politician, but I legit mean it because I am really just, I'm not sure. I don't see it in the cards anytime soon, but I don't know if like circumstances change, if, if, you know, I'll change my mind. It's one of those things like in an hour, a politician may do the wrong thing and you're like, what are you doing? And you're like, I, I mean, need to run. I need to run yeah, for that. I mean, if I haven't done that already, I mean, <laughs> uh, given the 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 challenges of uh, the state of just the world right now. No, I mean, look, you know, you. It's not just about wanting to run to run. I mean, it. There's a lot more that goes into it, and mm -hmm. it, right now, I mean, it's it's. I just don't see it in in my immediate future. But I, as I said, I don't know what five ten years down the road will hold. Okay. Uh, and this will be the last question. Do you plan? I think you might have answered this, but I'll I'll uh, I'll read it to you anyway. Do you plan on doing a United We Eat two, and what would that entail inside it? So the the answer to that is is yes. Pro like it's it is likely that so United We Eat like second edition would have as I said, um, you know Guam, Puerto Rico, our territories, the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, and. Uh, who am I missing? I I'm like <laughs> Rico. I think with the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, Guam, uh, American Samoa, and I think there's the U.S. Marshall Islands as well. Um, so you know, we would certainly want to cover the territories if we do a United We. Now, I've also thought about doing United We Rock for charity as well. So I'm giving portion of this to Feeding America. Um, I was thinking about doing another cookbook doing with um, you know like music folks. Um, submitting recipes um, and doing that for charity. Who knows if I can pull that off or not? I have I have some like relationships that might be able to get it, but I don't know. So that's one that's in my head too. Um, and then the other one that I'm thinking about doing is doing something similar, but for Canada. Mm. Uh, I'm a huge like fan of Canada, um, so I'm thinking about calling it More Than Maple, a love letter to Canadian cuisine um, that would cover you know sort of the history of of you know the uh, food and culture of Canada through the provinces and that sort of thing and the territories there, which would be a fun little project for me. I don't know if anybody else would care about it at all. But so bottom line is, is that this will not be the last cookbook you see from Capri Cafaro. <laughs> and that's good to hear because the first one, I guess, is, turn is turning out to be phenomenal. Well, thank you. Thank you and, so much. Well, it makes me hungry. It makes me want to go <laughs> snack and, and do that. But I, I think I want the 10 layer <laughs> Cake. Oh, it's serious business. The ten layer, the Smith Island ten layer cake is serious business, and I highly recommend it. If you don't want to spend all that time, you can still get the book, but you could also get Smith Island ten layer cake online directly from Maryland at, from Gold Belly. I just saw this. I'm not. This is not a Gold Belly advertisement, <laughs> but um, apparently you can actually order Smith Island ten layer cake directly from Maryland and have it delivered to you. Well, that's like that's like uh, the old um, Briar Hill Pizza. They would, they would ship it anywhere in the world. And handles. And yeah, handles. They'll, the, yes, that is correct, people. If you – specific stores. Handles Ice Cream is one of the biggest ones. Briar Hill Pizza, they will ship it to wherever you want to go in the world. Maybe not the world. Maybe the, I know the United States. 
That, uh, well, that's it's always good to know. I actually didn't know they would ship Briar Hill pizza specifically. Um, I mean, I do know like handles and Gorin's. I mean, I got Gorin's shipped to me <laughs> for, for Easter. So, um, you know, but I did, how, like, you're, I'm going to have to look this up now. If you that, was, no, that was when the old Avalon was there. Ah. The, old, the old Avalon yeah, like, back in the day. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they do it. I've heard they do it, but I'm not specific. But I know I back then. Look it up. Yeah, get it shipped to DC. I'm like, I ordered a My pizza. It'll be here tomorrow. Newport, New York. So I'm gonna have to find this. But if it exists, we're gonna have to know about it. Yes, we're definitely Capri. It's always a pleasure. You too, Tony. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, you for taking night. time out of your busy schedule and joining me tonight. You're always welcome on my podcast to announce or just talk politics. This is awesome. This is such a cool concept and a great um, format as well. Very, very professional. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Check yeah. out other podcast interviews and videos at Anthony Spano, anthonyvspano.com. Thank you, everyone. God bless.